what's up? Here we are, another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast coming at you from the great state of California. Well, at least the part we are in right now is the great part of the state of California. This episode, again, is brought to you by none other than the iconic brand, Lynchburg, Tennessee, Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey, Jack Daniels, the one and only enjoy it responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. It's been there for us so many times. Just this duck season, just camps and dinners and camaraderie and smiles and stories. I love it. We do not abuse it. We do not take it for granted for what Jack Daniels does for conservation and our lifestyle of being the American hunter, the American fisher, the American conservation and the American Provider. Today's episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast is also brought to you by our friends out of Durham, California, g Rap Baits. I love fishing. I don't get to do it nearly enough. My favorite is offshore, but this week I got to be on the Sacramento River chasing stripers with these baits that Garrett and Hank are building and engineering and mastering. And I also got to go after bass and crappie with their baits. And you talk about a blast. These guys are tearing it up. They're innovative. They're young. They got a ton of passion, a ton of vision. And what I like most about them is that they open their arms, they roll out the red carpet for us, and they are salt of the earth human beings. Today's guest, Hank DeBose, Garrett Dixon from g Rap Baits. We're going to talk a little fishing We're going to talk fishing in California and other places there. These guys know that their baits are performing on a daily basis. Hank, Garrett, welcome, my brothers. How's it going? Thanks for having us. Okay, Hank, I've known you for a good bit now. A few years. Here's the deal. Here's how I try to explain Hank DuBose. He's so humble and he's so quiet. But the dude is an absolute killer. Like, right. I had no idea for the first three years of our friendship. I did not even know you had a bait company. It's like crazy to me. And then you have the best turkey hunting. You kill the biggest blacktails. I'm not going to say where or how or how you do it, but nobody knows this about you. Is it your goal in life just to sneak through and just stay in your lane and stay over in your corner? (laughs) Oh, it's just, you know, it's, I feel blessed to do what we do. And, and so you just try to stay humble with everything and, and. The more uh, humble you are, the better things seem to come your way. And so, yeah, we just, uh, it's more about having fun and enjoying the people you're with than, than anything. And when there's good vibes going, that's when everything works out well. When you talk about good vibes, I think that that's the number one thing that it takes to be successful with turkey hunting. If you, as soon as you start to think negative or pessimistic about the wild turkey, they'll literally like humble you in a heartbeat. Like they, you're like, Oh my God, this day's terrible. They're just not cooperating. I haven't heard a gobble in four hours. And then boom, here comes one drumming and you're not even ready for him, huh? Yep. That's why you just got to stay positive and, and it can happen anytime, you know, and that's what makes it fun. You don't know what's going to happen. So when you go out there, that's what makes the good days that much more special. You remember them forever because everything just works out so well. It's so much fun. And then the days that you go out there and, and, and they beat you, you're humbled. So it's, uh, it's always just fun to see how it works out one way or another. Yeah. And I love seeing it. I, I, your style is a lot like mine. You are more of a cut them, get them fired up. Maybe not so much off the roost. It's great for kids, but you're more like me, 10 o'clock, get them coming off that first hand and then getting them fired up. And getting them on that decoy, whether they're knocking over a Jake decoy or trying to mount a lay down hen. That's your favorite. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's like duck hunting, anything like that. It's, that's all part of the experience, you know? So getting them, getting there and getting in on them where they don't know you're around, especially if you don't have a blind or anything, uh, you get to see a lot of cool stuff and, and it's more about the birds working and, and getting them fired up and, and getting that going, you know, that's what it's all about. So the similarities I see with this, Garrett, are you love to duck hunt, but you also are known as the fisherman. Like you've guided in Alaska, you fished all over the world, you have mastered the stripers, you've mastered the bass, you, I've watched you tied knots, I've watched you, I'm very impressed with your boat skills. I'm very envious of guys that can work a boat that way and be a good captain and, and, and be in and out of the shallows and the deeps and knowing which parts of the river, what it takes a lot of expertise to do that, a lot of experience, right? You got to have a lot of hours behind that wheel. But thinking about what Hank just said about turkey hunting, it goes for fishing too, because as soon as you're like, oh my God, you know, 600 casts today, we haven't got a nibble. And then as soon as you sit there and you're not paying attention, 
you're, you're, you're humbled, right? You're, you're surprised and you've got to stay on the ready at all times. Right. Right. That's just it. in fishing, you know, like you got to know what, you know, you're fishing for and know your surroundings and what it, the capabilities are in the water that you're fishing. And once you know that and believe in that, the rest will come. You got to just be yourself and fish your water and fish what you know, not worry about anything else or what's happening and just go as hard as you can at what you love to do. And that's how I've done it with fishing and ducks and everything in my life, including our bait business. I just go as hard as I can and the rest follows. And I want to try to stay as humble as I can with it and just take one day at a time and one step at a time. And, uh, that's, that's, that's really the basis of it, you know, and I've put, I don't know how many hours on the water, but, hundreds of thousands you know that's what i've done my whole life is fish and um i try to take every day as a learning experience i don't want to not learn anything on any trip out every time i fish i learn something every day it's not ever taken lightly like the littlest things mean a lot to me in fishing so i pay attention to all of that and i do the same with our business and uh with hunting as well and that just seems to work out let me ask you this garrett a lot of times when fishermen get hot or hunting hunters get hot, the first thing that comes to mind is I'm not telling you where I'm at. I'm not telling you what I'm using. I'm not telling you anything that I'm doing to get these fish. And there are some guys out there be like, Oh man, I've been throwing this and I've been doing this and they're, they're open book about it. But what is the first, what happens when are you prototyping these and you got this idea for a bait? And then you and Hank talk, or you started, you started before you met Hank, are you prototyping them? You're like, man, I'm having some success on this deal. What makes you want to take it to market and show the world how you're catching all these fish? Cause that's the way I see it is like, you guys are onto something and you're hammering them. Or is that not how it starts? Because in the end, at the end of the day, if you asked Hank and I, our, our number one goal with that with our bait business and everything is we want everyone else in the world to have the same success we do. We don't want people to go out there and have to use a special bait or be able to use it a special way. Our goal is to have anyone that wants to fish our bait be successful with it. And that's why we want to share it with the world. Is that yeah. kind of right, Hank? Yeah, we love it. Uh, you know, my favorite part is, is when we get to see people go out and uh, they catch their personal best, whatever species they're going after, on our fishing lures, um, that's that's what makes it a lot of fun for us. That's what I enjoy the most. That's the most rewarding part about the whole thing, is getting putting a, a bait that's good enough to catch those big fish and watching just your average everyday guys, blue collar fishermen, go out there and and have success. Sack them up. And are you seeing this consistently? Because I I remember when we started banded. And you start to get those pictures of guys with ducks in your waders or a jacket or a beanie on. And then same with kind of jargon calls. You know, you get this picture of a guy with a strap of ducks. They're like, best duck call I've ever had, easiest blow, whatever they're saying, right? We're by no means the best. We don't sit there and say, hey, we, we're reinventing the duck call. Because there's guys like a guy from this area right here, Joe Lairs, is one of the masters of all time. The best of all time, probably, when it comes to machining and figuring out how to make a duck call different and being badass. Our waiters, they were pretty, in, you know, innovative with, with what Christian Curtis and Eric Larsgaard did in the, the design of that. Are your baits different than what's out there? Because a waiter could be a waiter. There could be a, the mindset of like, I'm, you know, as long as I don't get wet, I'm good, right? Or a duck call could be a duck call. I've been blowing this Loman right here, this, this Falks for years. I'm going to keep doing it. Is your bait that much different that when people fish with it, they're like, Holy smokes, dude. The yeah. way it swims, the way it acts in the water. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of glide baits out there, but we really focused on um, bringing those custom glide baits, some of the features off those cu custom glide baits to the majority market and the everyday fishermen where they don't have to spend $100, $150 to get a good glide bait that size with the features we have on it. We want to bring that to everybody. And uh, so they... Uh, yeah, it, it's it's no different, you know, just like a duck call is a duck call to an extent. Uh, but we have worked very hard to make it where the average fisherman can pick it up and use it and make it work correctly. And 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 so, yeah, we we love it when kids, women, anybody with little experience fishing can go out and, and catch fish on. That's what we were shooting to do. Yep. So it's you're saying that this type of bait is available. 
but they're more for somebody that's so serious about their fishing that they're willing to invest hundreds of dollars. But you figured out a way to manufacture these baits for an affordable price where the everyday guy can go and get a bait that he can see the success of one of those hundred dollar baits on. Is that it in a nutshell? Yeah, that's right, man. Like it, it comes down to that, just like you said. And we have guys that are at professional levels on our pro staff throwing our baits. I mean, some of the guys is good as anyone in the country use these baits and then you got young kids and women and everyone that can use these baits and everyone can be successful with it and that's that's what we're after is everyone to succeed and do it at an affordable price not everyone has lots of money where they can just go and, and afford these high dollar baits if you got a you know average guy might only have an extra 50 or 150 dollars after a paycheck he can go right out and pick up one or maybe two of these and then still be able to carry on so that's kind of our standpoint behind it what were you saying, Hank? Yeah, we just really focus on the blue collar fishermen. That 100%. that's that's the people that that we built this bait for. We uh, uh, you know really worked with our factories to ensure quality and and strength in our product, and and so we really want to give that value to them. That's who that I mean that's who we are. We have normal jobs doing normal stuff. So. Uh, the blue collar fishermen is who we, we target for is we want this bait to work for them the best. 100%. Okay. So the bait that I'm holding in front of me right now, you guys will see it on the foul life social media and this life ain't for everybody's social media. I'm holding what these guys have named the sneaky Pete. I think that I heard you guys nickname this the bone. The other day, is this the one you were referring to as the, bone, the bone, the color color. Of the bone? Yeah. So this is the bone color, sneaky Pete. The tail is awesome on this. It's a realistic tail that is that rubberized. Rubberized, interchangeable. Rubberized, interchangeable to where you can change out colors. Seven different Okay, colors. so teach me something, both of you, real quick. Let's start with stripers. This out here is, you know, stripers are rockfish. They come from the Chesapeake Bay, the inlets of Maryland and the eastern shore. I've caught them over there a lot of times, and they're awesome eating. I've never seen them the size of what you guys catch out here. I don't want to talk about any of your secrets, but I want to be educated on... What is this bait doing once it goes underwater? When you when you cast it out on a bait rod, okay, or a spinning reel, right? You can do both. Yep. Or is it is it heavy enough where it falls on its own? Do you have leader the leader, and do you have some weight on there? Um, and what is going on under the water to make that fish go holy? I'm going to eat that thing. Is it, does it make noise? Does it smell different? Because on the, on the packaging, it says something about scented tail. So teach me what's going on once that bait hits the water, how far is right. it falling and what is that fish experiencing with it? Absolutely. So the bait is a glide bait, which is a hard bodied swim bait. And more than, um, we do, our bait does have scented tails, but more than anything, what a glide bait does is a glide bait imitates a real bait fish. And a bait of eight inches has what we call drawing power. And large swim baits will draw fish. In clear water, they can see it, it's realistic, and fish like to feed on other, uh, above them. They'll feed above them almost 80% of the time. So when that bait's swimming, it's drawing those fish. It's a it's a power, it's a real powerful tool in your arsenal. A lot of other baits, they won't draw that fish to just keep chasing it and chasing it. As that bait swims and glides fluently through the water, it keeps those fish intensely chasing it. And then with a long cast made, it gives a fish a long, a, a long time to chase that bait. And, you know, 60% of the time they chase it down and they bite it. That's the basis behind it's glide bait is just imitating a bait fish that's either wounded or just swimming casually through the water you can take our bait and you can speed the reel handle up and it'll imitate that fleeing bait fish then you can throw it out there and cast it on just slow lazy reel cranks and just create a bait fish swimming on the water column that's just doing his thing and up above in the surface fish will come up and eat them and for whatever reason big fish like to eat glide baits it's a larger meal it fills them up. They can eat once and be done. They don't have to keep feeding. It uh, always has been a fish catching machine since they've been out. And our bait really cuts well in current. That bait will really work extremely well in current. The shape behind it seems to excel in currents. It works great in lakes. Um, we got an interchangeable tail, like he said. It comes with the rotating hook hangers. Um, all around, what do you fish mean, catch what do you, a machine. What do you mean by feeding above the bait? Well, we got, 
Does that mean that it comes up to feed? Yeah. yeah it, if so you, it feeds above where well, they're at. They, if you look at a fish's eyes, they're they're on the top of the head, like a striper or a large mouth. And so the, they're designed to be looking up when they're laying down there about what's above them. And with the slow sink rate that we have, it holds it above them longer so it's not falling below them. Uh, and so it just holds it up in that, that strike zone, that sight zone for Absolutely. them for a long time. Yep. And so that, Keeps, that fish is always are they on the hunt or are they woken up are they down there so you can trigger them they're, you can trigger you can trigger them with a bait like that well they're, they're opportunistic uh, animal you know they're a predator so they're just like all predators you know they there's times that they're more aggressive and they're on the bite more and they're hungry and they're out searching and hunting but then there's also times when they're laying there and they're not necessarily on the hunt but if the especially the on the bigger size because they get a good size meal and they don't have to work that hard for it they're going to take it and and so that's where you want to be able to move it slow and keep it in that in that sight zone in that strike zone for them as long as possible yeah. keeping that bait up above fish is key on these kind of baits so if we're fishing in let's say a cut of the river that's 15 feet deep. I don't even know if it gets that deep. Is that a normal depth in the sack? How, how deep oh, is Oh, absolutely. We okay. have holes. Uh, 18, 20 feet. 30 deep. feet. 30 35 feet. feet. You cast it out there. <clears throat> how long do you... Educate me on the really real in process of this kind <clears throat> of bait. Do you let it fall on its own for a certain amount of time and let some line out? Or do you automatically start reeling in as soon as it hits the water and keep it at that? Or Dude, educate that, it or, do you, or you just see what the fish wants? So it day. depends on where, where they're laying in that hole. If they're down towards the bottom, you know, and the, and the clarity of the water isn't that great, then, yeah, you need to let it sink a little bit and, and get down there and where they can see it. But if they're, you know, laying, if your hole is 30 feet deep and they're laying at 10, 10 feet down there, 15 foot deep, then, yeah, you don't have to let it sink that far. Um if, the, if you got good clarity of the water. Absolutely. That's just, he said it about right. Those fish are, they're suspended in the holes. They can see, you know, anywhere from eight to 15 feet, depending on your clarity. If you have, if a human eye can see eight feet, that fish can see almost 16 feet, twice what we can see. So if you got good clear water and you're in a 25 foot hole and that bait comes through there and they're seven feet off the bottom, they already have it pegged. They know it's there. It's 18, 20 feet above them, but those fish are going to come and get it. And you may think that sounds like a far cry, but they will make it happen. Then if you're in slow, uh, shallower water situations, say less than 10 feet, you start the bait on the surface as soon as it hits because that's when bait fish are wounded or if an osprey drops a bait fish and it's crippled, it just flutters up on the surface. Those fish are already looking at it in less than 10 feet all the time. So, you know, like Hank said, and then if they're down lead deep. Is there a, without giving away industry secrets, do you guys get in scuba gear and dive under the water to see what the bait's doing? Do you put it into a big aquarium? Is there, how do you guys Pools. know? <laughs> yeah. Because to me, when you look at the murkiness of that river, I'm like, there is no freaking way this thing can be seen. But you guys know that these fish, I mean, they can see it or they hear it. Does the water it shake different? Depends. You know, um, yeah, we've uh, in the pool and when we've been testing and, and designing the baits, we got in there. They have rattles built into them, which that we think helps us in the river conditions because you have moving water. And so there's a little bit more noise in there than a, than a lake setting. And yeah, the, the noise travels quite a bit underneath the water. So, and the vibrations, uh, of the swimming action can also play effect into that. They pick up on that. They can feel the vibrations in the water. They're lateral and, line. And so, yeah. And so we, uh, we, a lot of these glide baits aren't, uh, don't come with rattles in them. And, and, and so, which, like I said, in, in the river conditions gives us an advantage, we think. And that's why in the currents and in, in the faster water, we've had a lot of success. Okay, so how does Hank and G-Rat Garrett finalize the size? How do you know that that's where we're going with this? Do you know that we're going to target a specific fish? Why is, why is this bait this long, which is seven and a half inches? It weighs two and a half ounces. That's what it says on the packaging of the sneaky Pete. What, what how do you, does Garrett and Hank settle on this size? And because I've seen them smaller, I've seen them bigger. I think that you guys might even, you know, talk about what's coming. I don't know if you are, but how do you settle on the size of the sneaky Pete? A lot of the glide baits are on the larger size and, and that's due to the speed that, that, that you're retrieving them. 
Um, a fish will, if it's got longer, more amount of time it has, the bigger bait it will eat. And that's why a lot of your reaction baits are a lot smaller because they're, you're reeling them at a, a higher speed and, and you're just getting that reaction out of them. Whereas this, they have more time to think about it and and kind of size it up. And, and that's what you're going for with a larger bait. You know, they're getting one meal that they would at one time, rather than having to eat 10 smaller fish or hit six seven schools to get the same amount of food they can do it in one whack but if they're going too fast they don't have enough time enough time to size it up and and so that slow sink and that slow swim rate really really does the trick for them when you you start talking about the slow swim rate of a bait but you can speed it up with the speed speed that you real real speed yep that's almost like everything wrapped into one that you want uh, that a fish can do if it's a crippled fish or a hurt fish you got that slow down like he's you know he's just out there loopy as heck doesn't know what the, the he's doing as a bait fish real lethargic real lethargic Glides, just- and to me that would be like man this i'm gonna go get me an easy meal that's it. right so do stripers get aggressive like a bass would to where when they see that speed thing it becomes a challenge more to aggressive them? really twice stri- as aggressive because when stripers fight in my experience I've always considered them non-fighters. It just seems like they're just real easy to get to the boat. Um, maybe I'm not catching the right ones, but the rockfish I've caught in Maryland and the few stripers I've caught out here, I've never had like a real, real good fight. But then again, I've never caught 35 pound, 45 pound stripers like y'all are. But it seems to me like there's a lot more aggressive fish out there than a striper, but you're saying that they're an aggressive fish. Absolutely. The striper to me is one of the most aggressive sport fish we have. Um, they come out of the ocean When you get fish in the system that have been in the, you know, system less than a week or say, they're hot. They are strong and they are ferocious. They're here to feed and eat. Well, when they get in the river systems, they, 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 they they become the ultimate predator. Bingo. They don't have predators. So they don't have to worry about hiding as much and and staying tucked into things. They can get out there and, and get after it. And, and this bait to a striper, an eight inch bait. That's an easy meal for a 14-incher to a 40-pounder. Stripers are not afraid to eat a bait almost of any size. They are that much of a predator that they'll. Uh, we catch 14, 16-inch fish on this 8-inch bait. We reel them in all the time. And then you can catch a 40-pound fish on the same bait wow, just because amazing. that shape imitates the bait fish set size on, the, on a general consensus, you know. Okay, then go the Five, other way. We got a 5-inch bait also, and then this is an 8 Will and if you look at a range of bait one? fish, if you took a you know a random range of bait fish and you just say you thrown at forty of them, you threw them up there. A lot of them are going to be between that five and ten inch range. Will a big fish like a forty pounder eat a the other way of the spectrum? A small bait, small absolutely. Bait. We last week uh, we had a guy on the Sacramento River, Salmon Sack River, Mike Rasmussen, that fished our fifty fished our pistol peat which is a five and a half inch bait and he caught a 50 pounder on it his client hooked a 50 pound fish on a five and a half inch bait because it's all about matching the hatch sometimes just like they say in fly fishing and all you match the hatch you put the size bait on your rod that's the size bait swimming in the water and you're going to be successful anywhere in the country fish are naturally eating that size bait they're going to eat your bait so why what would you fish more realistically if you're in this part of the country do you go to this size bait more often than the smaller one or are these fish more opt to bite a five inch bait or seven and a half that's all water dependent that's all on the fishery you're on if i'm on a fishery that has got a lot of small bait in it I'm going to go grab that pistol peat and I'm going to stick with that pistol peat. If I'm in a fishery where I know the bait swims six to eight, 10 inches, I'm going to grab that sneaky peat every time. Generally, you'll, you up your bait size, you up the size of the fish you're catching also. So that's what I was trying to yeah, ask. Oh, yeah. that show. So we, we, you know, we target a lot of big fish. So <laughs> even out there on the, on the river, you know, you'll go out there and you might only get that one bite a day, but that's the bite you're going for. You're going for those 30 pound plus fish. And so there's days out there when the stripers are schooly and there's guys that go out there and catch 30, 40 of them in a day on smaller jigs, things like that, reaction style baits, where uh, the sneaky peats more for, you're, you're trying to catch the bigger, big ones, cream of the crop fish. So, so what was the, the and little, I, what was the five and a half? The pistol peat. 
So that's the smaller one. Yeah. So before we move on to different species, let's move on to the selection. We've talked about the sneaky peat. We've talked about the pistol peat. Those are both emulating bait fish. Very realistic. They come in different colors. Again, they have the 14. interchangeable tails, 14 different colors, interchangeable tails. They have scented tails in them. Rotating um, hook hangers. Rotating, rotating hooks, and rattle. And that allows the fish to spin with the hook and not against it. A standard fit, most glide baits come with a fixed hook hanger, and the fish can only spin 270 before the split ring will tie go tight and they can spin off you'll lose a lot of fish that way we fished our handcrafted baits with fixed hangers for lots of years and we lost lots of fish also and, and the, we the hook knew, is how you're keeping them on yeah that rotating hook it hanger helps helps land a lot of fish i've also heard you guys mention that you have that you make rats yes yeah. the name yeah we uh we have two uh top water rat style baits as rats in the water explain this to me um that well like around if you're on a fishery with a lot of docks like a lot of lakes docks around a lot of houses there's more rats Boy. mice things like that than that fall into water than than you think second off um you're just creating emotion up there on the on the water and we just have a big profile bait up there is what it is and and so they i don't we don't necessarily know if they are, know they're eating a rat every time or it's a, a bird a bird or a, a wound a big wounded fish up on the surface yeah. um you know it, it's it mm. just depends but yeah. we do the areas that we do see a lot of rock uh like a lot of riprap walls and stuff that have a lot of uh rats in them and, and things like that we do real well on those so and like hank said earlier bass are opportunistic feeders you put an opportunity in front of them give them enough time to look at it and, and they'll bite it but I, i'm just playing the devil's advocate here is it, are you just trying to catch a fish based on curiosity or as an, a, a perfectionist, like I would assume you guys are, what the heck would you ever throw a rat in the water for? Is that just getting lucky that they're going to bite it based on they're just not that smart of a fish because they're like, well, that's something I've never seen before. Because you just said five yes. minutes ago, Garrett, that you're trying to match the hatch like you do in fly fishing with a nymph or a dry fly. Is it on top water? Is it, is it swimming under? Um, why a rat? I just don't understand why a fish would ever eat a rat when they never see a rat. <clears throat> well, that's part of it right there. Also, is uh, is the diversity of what you're throwing. Uh, as far as it gives them a different look, it has a different sound. It's got a little bit different motion to it. Um, it puts up off a different style of wake. Um, and like our uh, magic mouse, you can do a lot of stuff with that. You can make a lot of commotion up there where you're doing a lot of splashing, or you can swim it nice and easy, and it just got a realistic swim to it. But it's just a little different. It gives them, it's just giving them something different to look at. Um, you know, a lot of uh, topwater baits are the same, and and so it just it just gives that fish a different something different to eat. And bass eat a lot of rodents. You you wouldn't think it, but in in the real world, if you were in a bass's eyes, that bass, I'd say every bass out there eats a rodent one to. 10 or 12 a year well you know a, it's it's like on the walking mouse we do real well underneath bridges that have swallows on them we do real well with the walking mouse under that because and the docks he's giving away some secrets now here he goes uh, god dang it him <laughs> be they, clear lake on the docks and find them <laughs> swallows and next thing you know here we go because those birds when they fall in the water they just sit up there and splash you know he's right and yes. and so things like that you know where you're using it to imitate a, a bird in the water but down below they just see commotion up top it's the right size it's the right you know it's the right profile fit. far as underneath that that yeah they we in certain situations like that we do real well on and you want some big blow-ups so you're saying that you could take a body with some kind of fluttering wing motion on it like that's trying to beat its wings of a crippled bird that fell off a tree branch over a dock are you guys going to go there that kind of sounds like a cool bait are they out there they're out there yeah a, 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 bird, a wounded bird bait yeah, yeah there's, there's a, one out there's a, there's a few style baits they they got some uh duck baits yep. out there they have uh flying a, frog yeah and uh they yeah. have a couple different style baits like that for sure okay so give me the rundown then what is available Let's let we we've the the sneaky Pete and the pistol Pete are are they your go to river baits? Yeah, they're they're our go to river baits for sure, and and lake bait like that sneaky Pete. We, you know we uh, developed and created that bait at Clear Lake, and um, that is probably my number one go to when I want to catch big fish on Clear Lake or the Delta. I grab that sneaky Pete because it like Hank said earlier you're not always fishing for lots of bites but if you fish for one that makes you happy in the end of the day and you can get a seven or eight pounder to bite it it makes your for me it makes my day well worth it I would like to fish for big ones so 
can be our, my go-to. Okay, sure. so then you name two different rats. You have we a have magic a, mouse. Mag, magic mouse and our swimming rat. Swim can and swimming rat. And which one was the one underneath the dogs? Because uh, I'm taking notes on what I'm going to do it clearly like tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. What one was the one? Magic mouse. Magic mouse. So yep. how big is the magic mouse? Because the ones he had in the boat the other day are pretty big. No, those are five. That's the magic mouse. That's five and a half inches long and it weighs 2.1 ounces. 2.1 ounces and it's five. So it's two inches shorter than this. Yeah. Is that the biggest rat you make? No, it, then we make an eight inch rat. That's four ounces. And where do you use this at? What is this? Is this going to be a river the fish Delta. Too? The, the river. rivers. We've had some guys like, catch some pretty big stripers right here local on, on the swimming rat in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. We have a few guys that, that get after it pretty good with them. Cole Barnes. Yeah. And and so it's, uh, it, like I said, it just, it just giving them something they haven't seen before. You got the, the pistol Pete, you got the sneaky Pete, you got the magic mouse, you got the swimming rat. And the wild willy. We got a wild willy. And a willy junior. And those are- uh, uh, like A walking bait, a walking, stick bait. Top water walking baits. For bass. Uh, for oh, bass any, stripers. Any um, species. A lot yeah. of species bite top water. A lot of times, some of the videos I've seen of, before we transition into other species of top water, schools of stripers just going nuts. Like it's really uh, f like- powerful to see um I, I think the last one that i saw was maybe lake pal i don't know if you guys have fished lake pal ever but their stripers i've seen like just huge schools of them feeding on top water what are they doing in that instance is it just bait that got to the top of the water or is it bugs hatching or what are they eating at that time the, the stripers the fish will corral the bait and they'll push the bait and they'll get them in big packs and they push them to the surface and the fish literally has to jump out of the water to try to flee from all these fish and the stripers will sit underneath it or bass several different species of fish will treat bait fish the same way they do it in salt water also they they trap the bait and they push it to the surface and they can just eat it they can get it and they can eat it and they're just running up and they're from the just bottom just going taking right mouthfuls as and they will work to push that to get those and a lot of times they'll use a gravel bar they'll use a break they'll use a buoy in the ocean they'll use something where they can kind of trap it up against and push it against and corral it do you and ever it, do you ever so when you're top when you're top water bait fishing for them now is this what you're trying to emulate or are they or obviously you can't emulate that right you'd have to have some contraption but no you can imitate it pretty good on a fast walking bait it just you know makes a lot of commotion and spits and hops and jumps and when bait fish get chased they get up to the surface and they spit and jump around so walking bait well in, in those bait fish you know that are seven inches they're eating something else too so they could be up there feeding um they could be up there searching for food themselves and so it, it's really just another uh uh option for them far as uh feeding fish or crippled fish or anything like that. You know, the, it, it's similar to the magic mouse situation, but you're just going after more of a fish, bait fish bite. Okay, so let's transition into staying on the river. There's a, sometimes there's really strong salmon runs for you guys here. Does G-Rat offer anything in this line that will let a guy up his odds? Or is that legal? To talk to me and educate me a little bit on salmon in the area. Well, salmon, um, you could legally fish for salmon with our baits, absolutely. And I think our baits will catch salmon. Um, last week, we had a guy casting stripers on the Sacramento River with an adult trout color. And he hooked a chrome 22-pound hen salmon. She bit it right off the surface. Um, we've had a few guys that we've, you know, we've wanted to explore that avenue. So Hank and I, Hank painted up some chrome and green sneaky peats like a quick fish because for years, you know, the sought after bait for back trolling salmon is a K16, K15 quick fish. Well, our bait will cut water and works like a quick fish in similarity. So we painted some up and uh, you can take them and back troll them. And you know, that avenue still not been explored a whole lot, but it could work. And we've had some people stop by some of the booths at shows that are from Alaska that took interest and thought that they could troll them and be successful on salmon with them doing that as well. So it's something that's not been taken over we too, got, too we heavy. We had a few guys over on Tahoe trolling them for Mackinac. Yep. Um, we had a guy stop by the shop a couple of days ago. He's going over to Pyramid going to troll them over there um yeah so we got a guy that goes you know kevin matson goes to the white river and 
fishes brown trout with them on that eight inch bait and the au color and so are you guys going to come them. out with these silver ones for salmon with all the salmon fishermen in i the don't world? know if they're going to bite it as well it's a, that's all a trial and error air trial. thing i think kind yeah of. Yeah, I mean, it, we're up for anything, kind of thing, but it's it's we're just trying to give our guys around here more options. Okay, another species on the river, is on where y'all live, where you're all born and raised, is the sturgeon. I've had some awesome sturgeon fishing trips in Oregon and Columbia Basin, Umatilla, before they even you know had outlawed it around the dam at Umatilla, which I caught several twelve footers there. But I am not a fisherman. I was invited out. I couldn't even tell you what we caught them on. I don't even remember. This was eight, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Can you legally fish for sturgeon with this, with G-Rat and will they bite this kind of bait? No, um, sturgeon are, are way more sensitive to smell um, and they're they're real slow. So they're picking stuff up off the bottom more so than out hunting anything. They're not side they're, feeders as much. They're looking for dead stuff. They're looking for fish, even if it's still alive, barely moving on the bottom kind of thing. Uh, they're not necessarily out hunting. They're more out scavenging. That's exactly right. Like a catfish. So that, does that take, what other, okay. You said catfish. I know they're in the river. Are these a good catfish bait? We've got, we've caught catfish on them over at Clear Lake. Um, yeah. it, it's not something that people usually target them with, but. Cause um, they're more like a sturgeon yeah. and they're. Yeah. Other. Here on the West coast they are primarily largemouth stripers, smallmouth, spotted bass, a bass based bait. But the guys down in Southern California are catching a lot of ocean fish on them. And then if you step over into the Midwest or East coast, the muskie and pike there jump right onto them as they're a big bait. Real and this will catch it, a muskie. Oh yeah. Real. Absolutely. The, the predatory fish, the, the big real predatory, aggressive fish. predatory fish. Are, so is this going to target. increase my chances and not make it the fish of 10,000? Cast. Yeah. Are you guys guaranteeing this? <laughs> Not gu nothing's a guarantee, but musky and northern pike eat those glide baits alive. We've had customers of ours that have sent us pictures. You know, you look on the page, on Instagram page, you can see some nice northern pike and some muskies that are caught on them. And um, I think, you know, that's an avenue we're going to try to explore more in the future with it. And um, it's going to be a great bait for so we, we my got a 10 inch coming too, which is something that's really should intrigue some musky and pike fishermen. My my good friend owns this place right here, and I have a trip planned up there in August. I'm inviting you guys right now if you want to go. But this um, – we'll th go through some of these pictures, you both. This is called Cree Lake Lodge in Saskatchewan. It's fly-in only. It's There's no roads. There's no access even by UTV in here. You have he, – he, he's got his pilot's license. He picks you up at the airport in his plane. Then you fly over, land on the water. He's got a lodge. Just go through some of his pike and his lake trout. Is this something that we should consider bringing all these baits up there and making this a G-Rat trip? Yeah. Because this guy's got the biggest lake trout I've ever seen, and this pike fishing's yeah. amazing. and lake trout will bite the sneaky, and these pike, this is amazing. These are some tanks. And Does he, I thank you, Chad. You ought, to, you ought to see his to, ice fishing, too. <laughs> well, I think we'll have to take you up on this. Um, what were Matt and Tim catching? Uh, lake trout. It's funny. So Matt and Tim... Matt Allen and Tim Little from Tactical Bassin, they like our product. And they took the Sneaky Pete up there to Canada as well in the Northern Territories, and they caught lake trout exceeding 15, 20 pounds on our bait. Really? Yeah. Look at that pike right there. Look at that thing. That's beautiful. It's giant. That's and beautiful. that right there is what I want to pin. Okay, now you see when you look at a picture, you see that clear water behind it? I can see right in the picture that our bait will show up a long distance, and they're going to bite it. So that, let's plan on and, – and, uh, obviously, this is covid because I was going last August and it, the whole trip got canceled. But every single time, every single fish this guy does catches, okay. and this is flying only. Like you cannot get on this lake. Well, obviously, I mean, Brandon is, he just, there's Brandon right there. He is the baddest of the bad, dude. I'm telling you guys will fall in love with him. But I say we try to get some of your baits up to him Let's and let him it. start endorsing them because he's a heck of a dude. Um, so that would be a place where I would like to see, you know, absolutely. the reaction. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that would be a live that would be a live trip to right me, there. this is these are these are older fish right to be that big you gotta you've had to see a lot of baits so this would be a good test of which i know that it's going to work because your guys's baits are awesome but that'd be a badass test right there right right yeah and, and we've been uh come pretty popular around here at least with uh, a lot of our outfitters on the river just because uh of our affordable price on them that uh you don't have to spend 100 bucks to get a, a good swim and glide bait and they can put it in their client's hands and then they can fish it. And if you end up losing, it, it's not the end of the world, you know, versus 
100 150 dollar bait or even more yeah so we'll get with brandon that'd we'll be awesome have him get a buy a couple baits to test them and then we'll go up there and yeah, yeah have a that'll be trip. a great spot to put them in front of some big ones i can tell by looking at that instagram page that'd be a cool trip cree lake lodge cree lake lodge that place is the bomb so now let's transition into what i got to experience this week with these bass Best bass fishing I've ever seen. Not going to say a word of where it was, but it's absolutely amazing. Um, are these when you guys' mindset comes with this bait company? Is it bass first? Was it was was it like we're a bass fishing company? Stripe. And then it tra oh striper Stripe Stripe first and bass bo both equal. What would you? I mean. We yeah. were up for anything. We didn't even know, man. We we know that. We're just I mean, trying to build good baits. Yeah. <laughs> so and does this work on a bass? Yeah. Yeah, girl. I mean, I. Yeah, we've caught a lot of big bass, especially on it. Um, and Clear Lake's where it made its name, yeah. Sacramento River. That bait's made its name on Clear Lake and the Sacramento River. What's been fun to see is is the glide baits were a early spring, you know, style bait. In the fall, time, winter. Fall, and, and now we're seeing guys throw them all year long, and that's been a lot of fun where uh, we have a lot of guys on Clear Lake that they have them tied on all the time. Year round. And in certain situations, depending on what the bite's doing and if they're fishing a dock or they have certain areas they like to throw them. And so they'll throw them in there then. And, and they've been picking up fish all year long. So that's been a lot of fun to see. And if you're a tournament fisherman, like on those lakes, these guys that can throw those, you know, you can you can bring the checks home when you get bit on that bait. So Sometimes all it there, takes is one kicker fish. Are there tournament fishermen fishing these? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we are. Uh, my buddy Johnny Pearl is up at the Wild West and he was practicing – not yesterday, the day before, he caught a five and a half pound spotted bass on one of our sneaky peats up at Lake Shasta. Steve, uh, Steve Kennedy did, did real well on one of the uh, bass. Is this FLW or is this Bass Steve Masters? Kennedy's Bass, bass Master Masters. Elite. Yeah, Elite Series. He, uh, we met him at ICAST and uh, he did real well on a, on a tournament. I forget where that was. He, he might um, be MLF now. But oh. it, it, was, it, it was a part of his arsenal for that tournament. So there's a new bass... I, Major League Fishing is another one that's competing with FLW and Bassmasters now. Are they? Is it FLW uh, is now underneath Major League Fishing, so now the FLW circuit is ran under MLF. Oh, and then Bassmasters is the other one. Yeah. Is there a, is there a tournament style like this for stripers? No. Um, there is for um, um, what's the. What, what other tournament style fishing is there? Is there one more? That crappie, crappie. crappie. There's crappie style. And then there's walleye. There's a walleye tour. There's walleye, and walleye is very big. That's the best eating fish in North America. Yeah, crappie, crappie, walleye, bass. Those are about the three. And then obviously redfish, there's... Uh, um, yeah, redfish, holes, so always. Yep. Yeah, redfish, they have a pretty good series. And then there's sell, sellfish and marlins. Yeah. Yep. No. So now could an offshore guy be successful on sales with these baits we, we we haven't really tapped into the market we don't have a lot of experience there uh we have had a few buddies uh clay when he's down in florida he throws them for everything and he says he's got everything he's wanted to on him <laughs> so. go to the sun, including sharks. Sharks. clay guida probably eats these things <laughs> he probably does <laughs> he probably trains with g-rap baits <laughs> he what, probably what, does how awesome is clay guida clay guida is the best he, he he's unreal he's one of the best people you ever meet how did you guys meet clay guida well, I guess we were at a show at Sacramento ISE show in 2018, and uh, I was working at the booth. And about 5:30 at night, I looked down, and he came around the corner of the booth, and I, that's where I met him. Oh, I he was there Hank working worked. with Chad Mendez in the in yeah. The, in the uh, well, and, and Clay's got his uh, gills and thrills things he, he's with doing. With Mendez, yeah. Yeah, and and so I met him at a UFC fight in Vegas. Yeah, is, is where I met him. And uh, we kind of hit it off there. And, and yeah, so ISC was a couple weeks later. So it kind of all. That's another Hank, unassuming part of you, Hank, is that you, you don't look like you, like I would walk up to you in a bar and be like, I'll whip your ass. And then I would get throttled. But like you're a world-class wrestler, state, state badass. <laughs> and now you got this huge infatuation with MMA. You go to all these fights. You're probably training underground. To where pe Garrett probably doesn't even know about it. You'll just tie us in a knot, huh? Oh, no, he no, will. I, I, no, no. I, I wrestled in high school and, and I, I love the sport of wrestling. And, um, you know, MMA is kind of that professional sport for it. And I just think it, it, it's – the ultimate sport. wrestler's the best. Yeah, it, it's just it's mono y mono. Do you follow it? Oh yeah. Did yeah. you see David Taylor and, and oh yeah and Jordan this week? Oh, four yeah. to four. 
Oh yeah, I hate, I hate does that he style follow it? Score. You should hear but these guys I, when I've, they get I've on. I've been uh, watching him and Taylor and and all those guys. Have you listened Burroughs. to David's episodes on here? Oh yeah, he's oh, coming yeah. on. He's coming on on Monday to talk about the Jordan Burroughs match. Yeah, and see, and you know, it just to be a wrestler, on, especially on that level, you just got to be so mentally tough and and God, it, different. It, it, it's brutal, and and so I just have a lot of respect for that, you know, and and I just think that it's neat that they. Uh, it, it's a mental battle as much as anything. It's a lot of physical, but um, guys like him are have to be so mentally tough in between cutting weight and preparing, and then you're out there on stage and and you know you're by yourself and you're going toe to toe with somebody else that's been doing the same thing, uh, training hard, doing all that. So yeah, it, it becomes a mental game for him, and it, it's a lot of fun to watch those guys. And that's why a lot of them love to hunt and fish because it's a mental game. It's, it might not be as grueling of going five rounds with Chuck Liddell and getting your face beaten off, but the mental part of fishing and staying optimistic because dude, we, we fished for six hours, five hours the other day and caught one fish, but that one fish brings you back to the water. But like Garrett alluded to earlier, I have the mindset of if I, I do two things when I go out on a hunt, whether we get them or not, I'm going to learn something and I'm going to get work done. We might take the picture of our life out there with no birds. We might pick up on a decoy spread of what if we would have done this? What if we would have hit this way? We didn't, what if we would have done this with this wind? You know, what if we would have done this with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the amount of birds in the area? So you're always trying to be shifty. You're always trying to say what's next and have be one step ahead of them. So I always have that mindset as, hey guys, today sucked. But we're going to get work done. And that's what kind of separates the, 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 the guys that get it and the guys that don't. If you hang your head and you're like, son of a bitch, I'm not going until this, you know, I'm not going again until it gets right. You're never going to be successful. You got to go through a lot of failures to become successful. Yeah. And that's kind of how we look at life in general. Bingo. You know, it is, is like that right there where you can't, there's not going to be an ideal time for anything or you got to kind of make stuff happen. And if you're, you know you're negative about it you're doomed from the start you're not gonna you're already out of the game if you don't keep that positive attitude up you're not going to make it through the hard times or the struggles that do come you know you're not going to get that that great picture on a day you didn't kill any birds because you're not you're not mine's not your mind's not in it and you're looking at it like nothing good can happen today nothing good's going to happen out of this you're not rolling with you're not playing the cards that you're getting dealt at the moment you know so some days you don't kill any birds, but uh, the scenery is just unreal and the people you're with are, are fantastic. And so you make the best out of it. And the, and the other part of it is like what we talked about the other night at dinner was you, you're on a boat that long and you have the mindset to be shut down or shut off or turn the world off or shut the world out because you're not catching a freaking fish. Who gives a shit in the big picture? It's it's the stories, the memories, and the doors that can open, the friendships that can evolve. But if you turn into that guy that becomes negative Nancy like and hang your head, and I'm not going to say that I've never done that. Like I've gotten to the point where I'm just like, holy shit, all this investment, all this money out here every day. You start to think different when you're. it's a business. But you guys are in the fishing business now. You have to stay positive because the last thing we want to happen – is for us to hate what we love because we made it work. And now we're out here testing product, doing photo shoots, doing video shoots, doing podcasts. Everything becomes about the brand. You got to keep that fire lit by the one and only word that we got into it for fun. Okay. We love this shit, right? And yeah. that's what you got to keep in mind at all times. But that's where I think like you do it right with focusing on improvement, because if that's all you got out of it that day, we're going to be better tomorrow than we were today. Uh, that sometimes gives you the fire to, to get through another day. You know, if you know, you're not improving, and you're looking all down on everything, there's not a lot of light to go off of. But if you had a bad day, but you say you learned this, this, and this, and we're going to be better tomorrow, you got confidence going tomorrow that you might not have the hunt you want or work might not work out the way you want that day, but it was you're better at it than you were yesterday. That's a great way to say it. And I think that you could, you know, your other business, your family business, if they didn't have that mindset that you just described, y'all wouldn't be shit. But you guys are the best in the world because of – that mentality right of mindset. And here's the deal is when your employees see that and your customers see that it's contagious. 
it's like, hey, if Hank's this way, if if Hank doesn't show that he's beat up or tired or lethargic, and you're up at three thirty and you're doing this, and then you're staying after the the, the work day and you're building the bait business and you're going to bed and late, no one that works like him. And there's sacrifices there. You have a wife, you have two boys, you have your dad, you got your family, you got your other business. The mentality of that is what makes the bait successful. Is Look at this. We're not going to cut corners, man. This is all of our sweat equity and pride and joy put into these. If you're going to do it, you might as well do it 120%, right? Yeah. But but part of the fun, and, and you know this, is watching other people develop their skills and, and watching other people get catch on to that contagious mindset of positivity and a better outlook on things. And so when you start seeing people around you start adopting that same thing and the success and joy that's bringing in their lives – that's a lot that's that's a lot of fun to watch you know so working with the guys at the shop it's uh you know you're you're just looking to improve every day that's it man and i think that that is what becomes the underlying theme the common denominator of why things become successful you you could get lucky once in a while there's no doubt that luck plays a role in some parts but in business in the entrepreneurial spirit of Say, I think we have something that will be fished in Florida, the Dominican, Canada, Sacramento River, Clear Lake, Blue Lake, you name it, Pyramid Lake, Lake Tahoe. You, you're not, everybody can look at it now, four or five years down the road and how many baits are out there, but they don't understand that without that positive mindset of what wrestling teaches you. Because yeah. I'm an athlete. Like I, I, I'm not saying I'm an athlete. Like, look at me. I'm saying like, I played football. I played baseball. I played soccer once in a while. I played basketball a little bit. I, I, I excelled at baseball and I always was upset at myself for not becoming a wrestler because I look back at the wrestlers I know and I'm just like, now look at, I look at their ears and I don't like that part of their look. No offense, Chad Mendez, but I will whip your ass if you listen to this. That was just an inside joke. But you look at their jo- their ears, you look at the stuff that they go through. It's not easy, but I always wanted to be one because of this, the mental mindset of what it teaches you. A lot of leaders out there, have this, the CEO mentality. If you go to college coaches like Gable or Kale or Chill, I mean- and, and John Smith. John Smith at Oklahoma State. If you go and talk to these guys and you talk to them about the people that have come out of their wrestling programs, the young men and women that have participated in their wrestling programs, you're going to see that a lot of them are leaders now. They have businesses. They have great families. They're great employees for somebody. They go on to excel because that mindset keeps them there discipline yeah and and once you find success with something uh you can apply the same style of doing it to other things you know you can you can apply a successful mind for baseball because i mean when you're a pitcher and you know you're staring at the batter you're the batter staring at the pitcher there's a lot of mental stuff going on there and you got to remain in in that mental zone and so you you can you learn to apply it to your everyday life. You learn to apply it to work, to businesses, to to whatever you're doing, and it uh, it helps you everywhere. I agree 100. percent And I think that as you guys continue to grow, G Rat, you're going to continue to strive because of that. Where it's easily taken for granted. You could get up tomorrow and say, "Oh, I don't feel like working," and that's when you start to fail. And that pessimism or that negativity or that unsuccessful day can lead to a day of like, you know what? Uh, and we talked about this the other night. People call it FOMO or the fear of missing out. It can, can go both ways. You got to balance it. You, there's a such thing as going too hard, letting the mind rest, letting the body rest, putting the right things into the body. We have a lifestyle to where we could party every night. And it's hard not to because this lifestyle is so fun. And I'm in different camps all the time and different people and partners and sponsors and the network and celebrities and musicians and I'm humbled by all of it, but the mindset has got to be, Hey, there's gotta be a balance here. You got to be able to sit down and go to business. You got to go to work. And that's why I think that the bait company of where you're at in such a fast period of time and where you're going and what's getting ready to pop and who you're surrounding yourself with, that's a badass feeling. Yeah. And it's got to be celebrated, it's but it's also got to be, it's also got to keep You got to stay humble with it and keep yeah, on the work. grind. You know, you can't let it go to your head and think that, oh, we're doing this and that. No, we don't, we're not where we want to be. We want to keep going. And most of all, we want our customers happy. Every well, day. I'll never forget when we went to ICAST for the first time, you know, we were just starting off. We just got onto like mass production scale. 
And we walk in there and uh-huh. we're walking past Rapala and Costa and, and all these big Oakley, all these big booths, big companies and, and Strike King, everybody's there. And, and we're walking through them all. And we're headed to the back where our booth is, you know. And you start to doubt yourself a little bit, you know. You're like, what, what, what in the hell are we doing here? Like, what, what are we even thinking doing this? Like, we're here trying to, you know, play against these guys. But if you believe in what you're doing and you believe in what you're producing, then, you know, it gets you through those times of that self-doubt of, of you know, looking at everybody like that. So it's easy to stay humble when it wasn't too long ago that we were in that situation where we were – Nervous, you know, we were intimidated. That's, that's the greatest feeling, though. To well, know we, that you have, like he said, yeah. they're going to get off oh, that you, plane. You you hold it forever, you know, and and if you hold on to those things, that's when those lessons learned kind of thing, you know. And and the one great thing about working in the fishing industry is everybody that we've met has been awesome. We've met so many good people and had so much fun with so many people uh, through the bait shop. Um, People take us under their wing, open up their doors to us. You know, uh, any resources that they've had, they've let us piggyback in on them with them. And it, and so it's just been a humbling experience the whole ride. So it, it, it's pretty easy to stay grounded. Which is what we started this conversation with about your humility and that nobody really knows what y'all are doing as far. I know that you guys are have your baits and I know that they're out there and people know them, but they really don't know how good you guys are at what you do because you really don't have that mindset of it's about us. It's about the product and it's about the brand and nobody's bigger than that brand. And that's what I always get caught up in is like, people don't believe me that I'm just an average duck hunter, like average at best because I can kill them in Arkansas when I get invited on private woods, the mallards are going to the trees. I can shoot a duck at eight yards over a spinning wing decoy that's allowed on private property in Arkansas. I can call okay, but I'm with guys that can call unbelievable. And then I can go to North Dakota and shoot them in a cornfield with thousands of mallards coming off the Missouri River. But it's because Jordan Sargent invited me to his network, his boots on the ground. So it's never me wanting to go like, oh yeah, we're killing them because we're the best. Are you kidding me? There's so many duck, there's so many eight-year-old kids in Arkansas that can outblow a duck call better than me. And there's so many duck hunters, millions of duck hunters in the world that are way better than me. And there's millions of fishermen out there that are better than you guys. And that's not the mindset of saying we're the best fishermen. We're not even saying we're the best bait. We're just saying that we have a different mousetrap here and it is working. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well said. And and we feel grateful for everybody that, that buys our baits and, and takes them out on their days off and, and fishes them or, you know, goes and hits their spot uh, with the them. Yeah. We're, we, uh, we're so thankful for everybody the greatest and all feeling the support. Is- just seeing our customers catch fish or I get flip on the Instagram and there's another picture of a guy with a 30, 40 pounder and I look at my partner and he's just, we, we cry, we smile, we laugh together. And it's all because of how happy we are to watch other people succeed, man. And it's just kind of something that's a truly life humbling experience. It really is. That's what, that's why success should be humbling. It, it, should, it should not be an ego game or raw, raw. Be, and that you get, you could, I'm not saying that. No, that's be, not what you, it's about. It, I'm not saying that you can't get caught up in it and rebound, but I'm saying that if you have that attitude of like, I'm the best there is, then you see it in hunting and fishing a lot. You can there's so much drama you know, in these gotta, fields. There's a lot of good people, but there's also a lot of competition and who's the best. And I think a big part of that now is what? Social, social media, media, right? It's like social media has made everybody live in their best life. And if they're not putting up a pile pick or a 30 pounder pick or the, the success, life isn't easy. Life can be a mother, you know what? But life, those guys that are putting those 30 pounder picks and those piles up, they've earned it. They've earned it. But but you what, don't need to extend that. But shove my, in your face, my you know? point was, is I don't think they're shoving in the face. I, maybe some of the mindset is, but the mentality becomes for the people looking at it. Oh, I got to have that. They don't understand that. How much hard work. I don't understand. And they don't understand how much failure has went into that picture. It's not happening every day. The, yeah. best, the best duck hunters in the world don't catch them every day. The other day we had 500 casts or whatever on that boat combined, and we weren't catching them that much. It, it, not Everybody goes through those peaks and valleys. Social media only shows the peaks most of the time is my point. Well, yeah, well, exactly. We were talking about that. That's, that's just the other it. day when we're out fishing. That's that's what's fun about it. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if today's going to be that day that you remember forever <clears throat> or you're going to go home with your tail tucked between your legs. Yeah. And I, and I feel like if you're going about whatever you're doing, and, and for the right reasons and the right mindset, um, 
it does humble you. Yep. It does. And uh, if you're just going and, and when you look at the people that are the best at what they do and, and truly the best, you know, the, the Jerry Rice's, the, the, you know, all time greats at whatever they're doing. No, um, no, no, no. When you listen to them talk, a lot of them talk about being humble. A lot of them are, it's not that they're not confident in what they do, but they know that life worked out well for them. Uh, there's things that they didn't control that went into their successes. Um, you know, and, and when you seriously look back at everything that everybody else contributed to your success, it's it's very hard to 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 not be humbled by that. Absolutely. Humility should be what everybody strives for in life. If you could teach them and I've gotten stuck in it to where I'm like, man, I'm in this, I'm you can't beat me. I'm I'm unbeatable. I don't want that attitude. And you 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 mature. Some people mature faster than others, but the number one goal is to reach humility and why you're really going out there to chase a duck or a striper or a bass. I like to look at it like what happened with our friendship the last three days, our new friendship, my new friendship with you know who, I'm not gonna say his name because I don't wanna give anything away. But all of that comes in my mindset of, that's why I do it. Where you go through different stages when you're 22, you're like, piles make smiles i gotta kill limit you gotta get past that faster yeah than you, if you're faster than faster than you think yeah if you're what, always what in it for a it, picture well what makes it on the day that you don't have that pile exactly what, what may the what sunset. joy you're gonna have if you don't make that pile you know what are you you're not learning about it if you're only focused 100%. about the pile and and yep. yeah you learn and, that and the best in the world get beat yes and guess who's coming on the podcast tuesday Iceman. no way yeah that's so awesome when i saw chuck get beat Going back to UFC, when I saw him get beat by Rampage, or I saw him get beat by, uh, I remember when he fought the Axe when he fought Vanderlei Silva that night and knocked him out. But when I would see Chuck Liddell on some of his losses, I would get sad. It was the same feeling I had when Mike Tyson would get beat. Because to me, they were the sh- the dudes, right? You never want to see your hero go down, and but their humility is what kept them back. And after the game was over... You look at all these years since Tyson, I don't know why he fought Roy Jones Jr., but after all these years, Tyson's matured into a different human being than he was back in the day. Yeah, the, even the greatest go through failures and that maturity Humility, process. I might not be the best duck hunter in the world, but I am going to get the best results that I can every single day based on my humility to put the bird first, the compassion for the resource first, the respect for the resource, the respect for the river system, the yeah. respect for the water, the respect for the striper, the Let respect the for the bass. Go. Yeah. And that all of that mindset will come back and go, you know what? This is what it's all about. Not being the best fisherman in the world. Yeah, even just respect for the opportunity you have of getting up today and going and doing what yeah. we do or doing what you do. And and if you focus on that, like I said, it's, it's very hard to not be humbled being by that. Being fortunate. To and you be, it better at. be very hard, too. It yeah. better be very hard to be. Well, to, it and is. when you see those guys like Chuck Liddell when they lose and they're all teary-eyed up there, you know, uh, and the other guy's getting his hands raised. Um I always, I always like that because you just get to see uh, how much they care. You get to see all that hard work. You know, that's what you're seeing coming out of them at that point. And, you know, how much they've sacrificed for that moment and it didn't go their way and how much it hurts that loss, you yeah. know. Five months of training camp could end with one right hook. And when you see that pain on their face, you know how much they care. You know how much efforts they've been putting into everything. And, and I always have a lot of respect for that. I always, I always enjoy that part of it. And it's better to know what that is. Like, I know how hard you guys worked on the river the other day. My mindset is like, dude, this was unreal. I got to see Casey and Tommy have a blast and Jay just have a bl- the, and, and not one time since they've left did any of those guys from Jack Daniels go, man, that day so worse. They, not one of them even brought it up. They had, I'll show you the the text messages from them. They're like, best trip of my life. Unbelievable time. Tommy think, literally told me that was the best trip of his life. That's awesome. Think about that's that. Awesome, yeah, it was the incredible. it was the worst the duck hunting has been all year. It was the worst the goose hunting has been all year. We caught one striper in four hours, and it was the best trip he's ever been on. Around good but people, and think good about vibes, that. It's dude. like even hearing him talk about turkeys. You know, it's like I want him come back out here. Oh, he already said he is. Yeah, no, I want him to come back out here because he's fun. He's passionate. It's good vibes. He's passionate. You know, when he he sees those birds and he gets excited, he's fun. It's and that's what it's about. You know, you take somebody out that. Oh, I've seen more ducks than that before. I've seen bigger turkeys or bigger deer, whatever the heck you're doing. Um, that that takes a lot of the fun out of it, you know. Having guys that are just enjoy it and appreciate it still, that's the most fun people to spend a day on the woods with or a day on a boat with or anything. 100%. All right, let's end it like this. You first, Garrett. 
last cast of your life. Guy, the guy tells you, whether it's the good Lord or somebody tells you, you never get to go fishing again. This is your absolute last cast. You're going tomorrow. You get one cast. What bait is it? What species are you targeting? And how does it go? I already know. Sneaky Pete throw, throwing our bait in the hitch color. Sneaky Pete on Clear Lake, my home lake, right in front of Rodman Slough. And, and it's for a largemouth? Yep. Hank, same question. Last um, cast. I know his. You know, uh, where we went fishing the other day, that's a pretty special spot. Um, but really, for me, it'd, it'd be about uh, who was with me doing it more than what I, what fish I was catching. Good answer. Who or, are you with? Uh, my wife and kids. Like if, that, if I got if I only had one more day to do it, that that's who I'd want to be with. Me too. And I, I wouldn't like care it. if we were catching crappie, panfish, whatever. Like it would be more about who you're with and overall experience. Than, Speaking of that, and I love that answer. We have to get some of these crappie in a pan. We just have to. I can't stand to see those things let go. I can't do it anymore, guys. I like, I literally am just like irking being like, and the guy, you know, our camera guy, producer, you know, who he's from the South and he thought we were absolutely out of our minds the other day by letting him go. Oh, we can't do that much anymore. No, I, I'm just I, messing I, with you, dude. I was thinking about getting the pan out the other day when we got on him. Oh I, my I, gosh. Cause they, yeah, I want to do that. That'd they are be, so freaking good. And I've heard nothing but good things about them. So. That's Garrett Dixon. That's Hank DeBose. G Rat Bates on Instagram at G Rat Bates. G R A T T B A I T S. G Rat Bates. Look at their baits online. Is it G Rat Bates.com? G Rat Bates.com, your nearest retailer. They got big things happening at retail. Mom and pop stores, independence, the big boxes. G Rat, they're the best I've ever thrown. I am not the most experienced fisherman in the world, but these baits make me feel like I am. Today's episode of This Life ain't for everybody podcast again was brought to you by our friends lynchburg tennessee the one and only the most iconic brand in american history in my opinion maybe besides budweiser maybe besides harley davidson but jack daniels is the most tattooed brand in the world did you guys know that there's more jack daniels branded tattoos in the world than harley davidson so think about that when you're going to buy your whiskey enjoy it responsibly never ever allow underage drinking and don't take it for granted that we're going to wake up on this side of the dirt tomorrow live every day to the fullest today's episode is also brought to you by our friends durham california you heard them here today hank debose garrett dixon g rap Bates. we're humbled to be a part of their success clay guida good luck in your upcoming fight all of the ufc fighters coming up in the next week stay safe stay humble and good luck in the octagon tom jake hit that button this song is called what you gonna do when the money's all gone written and performed by my man aka hoss leith lofton y'all take care all equal, that's what i think i don't believe it and has a bank make good use of your time on earth and don't make a dollar bill all this world